everyone, and welcome once again to the Vast and Ominous Comic Book Vault. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. And it's time once again, Dan, for new acquisitions. We have uh, changed up our format a little bit. Obviously, Dan and I are going to start doing this show completely together, and uh, we're going to see how it's going to go. And today, Dan, uh, we've got a bunch of books for everybody. Uh, we got several things that you and I read together, and then at the end, we're going to talk about some things that we read separately. Uh, and we're going to start off with some IDW stuff. We're going to start off with uh, Ninja Turtles number 19. And, uh, Dan, I thought that... Um, I, this issue was just a whole bunch of really, really fun action with uh, some really great relationship stuff for Michelangelo, of all people. Yeah, it, it, I felt like this was basically the payoff for everything that we've been building to um, so far with all the characters. I really like the relationship that Raph has with um, the guy that sort of flies off the handle all the time, like him, too. <laughs> oh, that's a really good point, yeah. Yeah, um, um, I, I feel like the turtles fit in really well in this world. Um, they, they all have a sort of place where they can latch onto and go. Like, Donatello has a really interesting relationship with the uh, Fugitoid, too. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was that, all that was really great. Uh, Which is neat, it, because he knew him before he realized he was the Fugitoid. Yeah, exactly. I thought all of that setup was um, really well done. And this series continues to impress me in that it's giving... It, it's turning this into an ensemble story, whereas before, Raphael and Leonardo were really the only turtles that got stuff to do in most, most Ninja Turtles things. I like that we're getting nice things to do for all of them, because Donatello is personally my favorite turtle, and uh, Michelangelo is not just the jokey guy anymore. He, he does that, but he has things to do, and I, I really like that about this book as a whole, but this issue was sort of the personification of you know, that whole thing. I think so, too. Uh, one of the things that I complained about when the series first started was that it was just a little bit slow. And yeah. it's really picked up speed now, and it seems like this was where they were headed. They really wanted to get to Dimension X. They really wanted to get to, as I keep saying, do all that really fun cartoon stuff, but make it work on more of a serious level. Krang is nothing short of terrifying in this book, but also kind of funny all at the same time. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with that. Um, I didn't expect the neutrinos to really become characters, really come to life like they, like they are here. And they're every bit the neutrinos I remember from that cartoon show, but there's, there's some emotional weight to them. Yeah, like, they're giving them really interesting um, character traits, and, and they're going places with them that are typical of a lot of soldier stories. Yeah, that's um, true. Like, where, where you have things like, I don't know, one of my favorite soldier stories that's not like... Um, Directly, you know, a realistic, real-time soldier story was like uh, Star Wars Republic Commando, those types of novels. And I feel like they're dealing, not directly because we're not, you know, I'm having a neutrino book here, but it's sort of doing the same sort of things like the morality of, of killing people, um, w what it means to fight for your country, all of those sorts of things. I thought that was really interesting. Um, speaking about that, I think this arc in general and this issue doesn't really have a ton of it, but it's got a lot of political stuff going on, too, that I find to be really interesting. Um, in that uh, Krang is this really evil dictator that's trying to kill off this race of people um, because he, he has this social Darwinistic view of the world and how if you're inferior to him, it's his right and, and uh, obligation to crush you. Yeah, well, and that's why he wants to turn Earth into the new Utramanon, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, he's he's cool with genocide. He's he's very much the uh, creepy brain version of Hitler. We de I mean, we you're you're right. We definitely have that going on. For sure, yeah. And um, I don't know. I, I really enjoy this book. This is one of my favorite things coming out right now. One of the favorite and, things and that a, I that I buy. And a lot of great action um, from Bates here. Uh, I, I th this is this is a book that has really jumped around a lot art wise, and uh, this is what it needs to look like. Yeah, I didn't care for the second artist that came on as much as I did for the first one and this one, um, the guy that's drawing the book now. Uh, I think Andy Kuhn was the guy that was drawing the middle, and then Dan Duncan was the first guy. And what did you say this guy's name is? Uh, uh, Bates. Bates. I don't remember his first name. But um, yeah, I think he's doing a good job. He has a style ben, that's sort of similar ben to the Bates. animated as like this. Yeah, Ben Bates. Okay, Ben Bates. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, and that's appropriate for this. Uh, that's that's really that's really what it should look like. Um, I think that we're seeing a lot of different ages of Ninja Turtles popping into this book. You know, you know, you know, in in and out. And right now, it's kind of the it's kind of the fun, actiony, lighthearted stuff. And then it's also, like you said, pretty political and, and, and a lot of wartime kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, big recommendations for me and Dan both. Uh, let's jump now onto uh, our other IDW book for the week. Uh, that's Star Trek Countdown to Darkness number two. And uh, Dan, I was really kind of surprised that you decided to read this one. <laughs> 
Uh, I've been on a Star Trek kick lately, and uh, I kind of want to get excited about the new movie a little bit. <laughs> I'm trying uh, to. Based on everything I've seen, I, I haven't been really all that excited, but I figured um, there would be no better place to, to try out uh, some Star Trek comics since this is around the new movie and um, IDW's been really impressing with everything they've been doing so I figured I'd give it a shot oh absolutely uh, yeah and, I, and I'm really glad you did you know you know, I, I enjoyed with all of its faults the last countdown and so I, I had to give this one a try and at the end of uh, the first issue we uh, find out that Robert April is on this random world that uh, Kirk and crew go to and uh, that and we find out Robert April if you don't know uh, was was uh, in, in Star Trek canon the first captain of the Enterprise who we never actually see on screen uh, except for in an animated series episode, Dan. Uh, that's the that's the one place we see him is in is is in a in an episode of the animated series, which is generally not considered canon. And uh, he shows up here, which I was really excited about. I was like, oh, that's cool. We're gonna make Robert April character do something with him. And uh, here we find out that he's been uh, on. He, he's another one of those in, in that classic kind of typical uh, TOS sorts of plots. He's one of those captains that uh, everybody thinks is dead and who is on this random planet. I uh, kind of giving up all of his old convictions about Starfleet and giving these aliens some technology and uh, breaking the Prime Directive and doing all that stuff and kind of throwing all the rules um, at the you know against the wall. Um, I didn't 100% uh, care for this, Dan. I'm not sure where it's going. Maybe it'll win me over as we go along. Um, I thought it was pretty typical, but then at the same time I'm mixed on it because it's also trying really hard to be a little bit more TOS, so I can't give it too hard of a time. It's just, I've been here before and I kind of I was a little bit disappointed that Robert, I felt like Robert April was a character I've seen before. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you in that um, it's it's definitely trying to be more TOS, and I like that about it. Um, one of the things I just thought of that I wasn't really thinking when I was reading the issue is we have Kirk here who's a little bit um, hesitant about breaking the rules, and I at the end of the first film, he's sort of left in a place where he he's validated in breaking the rules, and it, it looks like from the trailers of the new film, his irresponsibility or, or in breaking the rules is going to cause the crew to come in some danger. So, like, I'm not sure why he's changed into a different character in this book. That's <laughs> and then really he's going to get to the place he was at at the end of the first film by the end of this. Yeah. I think that's sort of strange. Yeah, that's that's definitely a little bit a little bit inconsistent, sure. Um, I do like that they're doing some Prime Directive stuff. I like that it's, again, it's trying to be Star Trek. It's trying to do those, those, those big ideas. And um, it does seem like it's... It, you know, I am getting a sense of how it's setting up the movie as opposed to just being a random story set in this universe uh, in that there is there is mention of a character named Marcus who, um, I think Alex Marcus, who's supposed to be Robert April's first officer, and I've got to assume that that's going to be probably um, the father of Carol Marcus because we know that Carol Marcus is in the movie and uh, mm -hmm. Carol, Carol Marcus uh, being a major character from uh, Wrath of Khan. So uh, I'm glad that I get a sense of where it's going. Uh, I won't get into it right now because I don't, I don't want to do spoilers, but... Um, there are a couple of weird uh, inconsistencies with regular Star Trek that are, that are that are with regular Star Trek canon that's obviously done on purpose just to change things for no good reason that I don't understand how they could possibly have been changed by Nero going back in time. One of them, I will give this one away. One of them is that Robert April was the was the captain of a different Enterprise, not Kirk's Enterprise. Why would you change that? What is the point of that? I don't know. And the other one is that there is a major character, as far as I can tell, unless there's some explanation for it, um, from the original series that is not only changed into a different gender, but also a different species. We'll see where that's going. That kind of, I, I was, that blew my mind. I was like, why? But anyway, um, this will be a hard book to talk about till it's done. Yeah, I agree. And um, one of the things that I sort of uh, thought was strange about this one in relation to the first one is we opened with a, with a pretty Spock-heavy scene in the first issue when it was sort of like the movie, a uh, uh, duality thing between Kirk Kirk and Spock, and Spock right. doesn't really get all that much to do here until the end, where um, he sort of just runs off for, for a reason we're not told. Spoiler assume, alert! Like, you can make uh, <laughs> projections about it, like at the beginning they mentioned that whole thing about his race dying, and uh, he wants to save them, and maybe he feels some sympathy with the race that's dying on this planet, uh, but... I hope that's I not where it's going, because I don't have any sympathy for them right now, so... Yeah, I mean, like... We don't really get all that much to invest in the race. It's sort of that cheap thing where, like, oh, they're being genocided. We we must care about them because something bad is happening to them. 
Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about their culture so I can be a little bit invested and see, like, oh, these are good people, you know? Don't, like, not that I don't feel bad for them for being mass killed, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's just sort of a, 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 I don't know, a, an easy thing to do, I think. So, um, I'll say, uh, I could go either way on this one. A uh, lukewarm recommendation for me. Uh, this might end up being really great by the time it's over. I am really enjoying the artwork. Um, it's a fun book to look at, and the writing is good, uh, dialogue-wise. I'm just not real sure about the plotting yet, so we'll see how that sure, goes. Yeah. Um, Dan, what's next? We have Thor, God of Thunder, number five. Yes! <laughs> and, uh, this one's by Jason Aaron and Asad Ribic. And, uh, man, this book is good. Uh, I loved everything about this. What, what, what did you think? Oh, I, I did too. Um, I am really glad that uh, Jason Aaron has so quickly on this book given us a sense of why we're in different time periods. And at first, I wasn't real sure what I thought of the idea of doing time travel, but I guess it was kind of inevitable that there was going to be a time travel element to it. Uh, because, mm -hmm. after all, if you just jump to the future with this Thor that uh, is old and looks just like Odin, and I love, by the way, that <laughs> that that Thor that when Thor in the present winds up in the future, uh, he he sees Odin and thinks that he's his father. That's great <laughs> stuff. Um, and uh, so, because you would, you know, and he's like, I'm not your father. Um, yeah. But but anyway. Um, I'm sorry. Hopefully, hopefully, I'm not giving up, giving away too much about it. Uh, but but the 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 whole the whole time travel element um, gives us this uh, this kind of I don't know where I was going. <laughs> I, I something that I picked up on yeah. in in relation to that was that's classic Thor blending science fiction with fantasy. Yeah, exactly. That's sure. what it's been all about since the beginning, and Aaron's doing it in a way that we've never seen before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's, he's doing what the best mainstream comic book writers do in taking an old idea that people really like and reinventing it and giving them that same idea through a different lens. Uh, I think that's what's so masterful about this, is he's been able to create something so compelling out of an idea that's so... That's been played out so many times. I guess the point I was gonna make, I, I was gonna make that that I, I just forgot about was was that um, I don't know why I didn't see this coming because we have somewhat of a post-apocalyptic. Uh, uh, thing going on with the future, right? Where you, you've got an Asgard where there's nobody else there. Uh, so, right. of course, that can't be the real future. Something's got to change. So, yeah, this is this is something I absolutely, obviously should have seen coming. But I was I was so invested in everything that I, I don't know why I just didn't think of it. Um, but I, Gore is one of the best villain, villains I've seen in a long time. Oh, yeah, his, his motivation's fascinating. fascinating. Uh, I don't really want to spoil Let's it not. for people. Let's not. Uh, because this is sort of where... You get this is really a character issue for Gore, I would say. And he's supposed um, to get his origin next issue, and that's exciting. Yes, um, we we don't really get his origin here, but we get uh, really what his relationship with Thor is, why he has this big beef with them, why he has a beef with all of the gods in general. Uh, it's really fascinating, uh, and kind of. I would say relatable, and you can see where it's coming from, yeah. which is, I think, the best Marvel villains, at least. That's how they are usually portrayed as being, whereas some of the, the DC villains are a little bit more just straight-up evil. The, the Marvel villains have always had a sympathetic... Uh, sort of streak to them, uh, at least most of them anyway. This book, again, without giving too much away, the most fascinating thing about it to me is that it is a discussion about religious versus anti-religious arguments. And it's it's very contemporary on that level, and yet it's very easy to read it without without that. With, with with without that that kind of um, that that kind of subtext, it's also just a really good story on top of it. I agree, and I think the the thing that helps in it not being like you said was Aaron's being very fair and balanced about his portrayal about both of them. Yeah, absolutely, um, sure. Because you have the the villain who has a legitimate motivation and and reason for hating gods, hating religion, hating all of that, and the hero of the book is a god. He's Thor, and and he has legitimate motivations and and all those sorts of things for doing what he's doing. Yeah. So. It's a really interesting conflict, and I think he's really fair about it. He's not really coming down on either side. He's giving, I think, a fair and balanced debate between the two of them, yeah. um, which which is in very good taste, because you don't want a book that's that's preaching the people either way, I don't think. That's right, and the last thing I want to mention about it is that I think uh, Ribic is the perfect artist for this book, because yes. the art, uh, along with the writing, makes it look entirely timeless. I was telling you earlier, if you hand this book to somebody, uh, and, and like, 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 let's say, let's say, you know, it's 
all said and done and you hand the trade to somebody and you don't tell them what the date is and you like scratch the date off of it, you'd never be able to tell when this thing was written. This could have been done in the 80s. This could have been done um, at the same time as Simonson. It's, it's, it's really cool how outside of time it is. It doesn't look contemporary. I agree. I think um, not only the penciler, but I, I think whoever's doing inks and colors on this helps uh, in that a lot. Um, I don't know. I, I can't say enough good things about this book. If you guys are at all Thor fans, you've got to be reading this. Yeah, um, I, I, I give it my highest recommendation, and I would say that it is probably in the top three right now of Marvel's best books. Um, I put uh, The stuff I'm reading, I put it right up there with Daredevil and with all new X-Men. It, it's right in that lineup. And I, and I know you would put uh, Incredible, Indestructible Hulk up there, too. I would, yeah, but I like this book just as much as Indestructible Hulk, so, you know, highly recommended for me. Uh, last book in our uh, segment on uh, books that we read together, Daredevil, number 23. And uh, this goes back to Daredevil's origin in a really interesting way. Uh, it, 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 when it opens up, I was so confused because... It, it, it seems like we're getting narration from uh, Matt Murdock as he's first going through the accident. But there's this really interesting extra piece of uh, detail, this extra piece of information that you couldn't have had, which is the driver was looking at his cell phone. And yeah, that was the sort of that was what threw me off first. And I too. went, well, now wait a minute. Like, if this had happened to me when I was a kid, it wouldn't have been a driver with a cell phone because we because because not everybody had him yet. And so I was like, what's going on? And I, I won't give away what exactly the story is, but um, you find out that uh, there is somebody who is doing something with the chemical that created Daredevil and um, kind of forcing people to get it. And this all plays in to going all the way back to issue one uh, with, with, with all of the things that Daredevil's been dealing with that all seemed inter disconnected for a while um, in, in recent issues we realized that, that with, with the coyote and with the spot and everything that it was all very very inter interconnected and somebody is really messing with Daredevil somebody that knows everything about him and we still don't know exactly what's going on we're, we're, in, we're in issue 23 and I cannot believe how far forward Wade's got this plan uh, Dan I couldn't believe it it's amazing, isn't it? Like, initially I had thought, like, the spot was going to be the mastermind behind this entire thing. And I was like, that's kind of cool. But it was so much bigger than that. And in, yeah. in, in here, it, it just, he pulls the scope back and it's even bigger. Um, Wade's going places with this book that every issue, I just don't know what's going to happen. And I love that about it. Yeah. Um, I loved the foggy stuff in this book. Me too. And, uh, and, and not, oh, like... The relationship between these two guys, I think Wade gets it, nails it, just as good as anyone else I've ever seen do it. Uh, it's a it's a com it's a complex relationship. It's not a light switch thing. It's not you know they they were they were uh, they they nearly lost their friendship and now they're just best buddies again. It's not quite that. I mean like like it's 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 very real. It reminds me of relationships I've had with people um, minus cancer. And uh, I, <laughs> I just uh, we 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 found out uh, at the end of last issue that maybe Foggy has got cancer, and uh, that's really that's really playing in everything too. And um, I don't know, man, the the mix of over the top crazy comic book stuff with with real focus down to earth drama, I've never seen this before um, done done quite as well as it's done here. I, I would say that Wade is sort of channeling what Stan Lee was doing back in the day and really goofy plotting. It almost reminds me of Stan Lee's uh, Spider-Man run in that the, the people feel 100% authentic, but there's all this goofy crap going on that they're dealing with, and it's really fun. Uh, like, this book has some really dark stuff in it. It deals with some really dark... Oh, yeah. It, it takes Matt and Foggy to some really dark places by the end, and... Uh, at the same time, we're, we got all these over-the-top guys that uh, have blindfolds on running around that, that dare to less to beat up. It's fun and dark. At the same time, it's a perfect blend of the Lee and Miller stuff, and that's what I really love about it. Did you ever in your life think that you would become so emotionally invested uh, in a very real way in a book where Daredevil literally gets decapitated and it's like a head and having to control the rest of his... Right? Like, it's amazing. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, Wade is... 
pouring his heart and soul into this character. I'm going to call it now. I think this is going to end up being one of the definitive runs on Daredevil. Absolutely. Up there with yeah, it, 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 is, it is already for me. And because um, we keep saying this is the freshest this book is, this is the freshest Daredevil's been in, for, in, in years and years and years. Since Bendis left, I would say. Yeah, and th that's 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 what I, a lot of people are saying. Um, let me ask you this, uh, just just real quick before we move on. Uh, sure. What what is your prediction of how long this run's going to go? Because right now I can't see the end of it. Me either. Uh, and Wade's one of those guys that loves to stay on books for as long as they'll let him uh, to tell a story he wants to tell. Like Flash, he was on for a really long time. I'm going to say fifty. Fifty, you think? I'm going to say fifty. I think it goes I, that long. I, I I hope that he goes longer than that because I, I don't want it to end. <laughs> I don't either. But I mean, Venom uh, is already on twenty seven or twenty eight. I mean, like like I, I see it, and I know that that, that that different writer is on that now. But I mean, like it's the same run without it being being cut off. Um, I see this book going at least fifty. Yeah, I, I would say so too. Like, he's got a long term plan laid out here, and I can't wait to see the rest of it. Well, now we're going to go on to some things that uh, that, that each of us uh, read that the other person didn't read. And, uh, Dan, why don't you start us off? First one I got is Indestructible Hulk, number four. This is also by Mark Wade, coincidentally. I uh, really like this guy's work. And uh, this does some really interesting things with Bruce Banner in uh, just sort of examining how difficult it is for this guy to form relationships with people and... Uh, Sort of socialize. He, he's the he's the ultimate social outcast in, in a way that Peter Parker was in his early days, but he can't really shake that. Um, it's sort of personified in this really neat scene in the beginning where um, Wade has Banner living in one of those nuke town places because they don't want the Hulk near any sort of society. So it's like this creepy uh, '50s nuke testing facility. He lives there, and. Um, it's really interesting seeing him isolated with all these like little plastic people around him. It's it's really kind of creepy, and um, it's really playing with the title of this book too. Because you have the Hulk who's literally indestructible. He's doing all these these crazy things, but Banner is the complete opposite of that. And um, I, I really like that about it. They, they, he's really playing up the duality of the characters without really giving Hulk any dialogue, which is speaking to how great this is. Um, I don't know. I, I thought it was cool that it was a tum that a Tumo was in here. I know no one really probably knows or cares who Atuma is, but uh, I, I thought that was cool. He's a Namor villain, and uh, I don't know, seeing, uh, Wade, Wade's been doing this with Daredevil, too, where he's matching the characters up with villains they never fought before, and I think it's really fun. Uh, other than that, I don't really have all that much to say about this. I'd uh, highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my first one is uh, Supergirl number 17. This is part of the uh, Hell on Earth story, and we're getting uh, down to the wire, down to the end of Hell on Earth. Now, I've not read all of Hell on Earth. Uh, I've read the um, all the Superman stuff so far, and uh, I, I haven't read uh, any of the, of the Superboy stuff yet. I picked this one up this week because I had uh, kind of a light pull list, and um, I keep going off and on on Supergirl uh, because I loved the first arc, and the second arc didn't do much for me, so I kind of jumped off of it. But then, every time I come back to it for a minute, I really kind of like it, so I... I I keep, I keep wanting to pick this up. Um, I really like this Supergirl for a lot of the reasons that she has so many problems in this universe, which is um, she's she's really young, she's really brash, she's really headstrong, she's got superpowers and she doesn't know what to do with them, and all she wants to do is go home. And it's 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 the it's the story of a of an orphan who can't go home, who wishes that she could, and um, Hell on Earth gives her the chance to uh, maybe do that. So she's working with a supervillain and not. Being Realizing it, uh, Hell is um, this Kryptonian that uh, shows up, and so far a lot of the Superman stuff has been about Kryptonic Kryptonians, and I don't know if maybe they're doing too much of that right out the gate with Fifty Two, but um, th that doesn't change that I really like this story. Uh, so we've we've got this, uh, and I talked about this a little bit um, when I reviewed this the Superman stuff. Uh, we've got this guy Hell who. Um, it's it's a H apostrophe E L. They're doing a bit of play on words there, but I sort of like it. Uh, <laughs> it's a very comic book. Uh, so 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 they, so they so they have this guy who uh, who has this master plan for how to bring Krypton back. And what's great is he's one of those supervillains who who what he's doing is wrong, but he's doing it for all the right reasons. Uh, and he and and he's got it in his head that this this is fine. This will work. No problem. Uh, he <laughs> wants to um, create this machine that he's actually created it now um, by here. Uh, he's created this machine that 
will propel him and Supergirl back in time to save Krypton, but the only way he can do it is by destroying Earth's sun. And so he has to destroy our solar system to go back to Krypton. And, um, you know, I, I question in DC continuity whether or not he couldn't have come up with some easier way to time travel, but whatever. <laughs> um, so Supergirl uh, has been duped into thinking that he's going to do this without hurting anyone, and he hasn't told her, and, and they're, they're, they're in love, and they're starting to, to form a relationship, and um, he and they're getting serious, and, and she she doesn't know that he's going to do all this. And um, in, this, in this issue, she finally finds out, and you get the sense that she's in denial about it, that she knows that... He He's going farther than he should, but she wants to trust him, and uh, he, he really tries to validate it here by saying, well, if this works, I didn't really kill anybody because we're going back in time and we're going to fix everything, and so, you know, you know, Earth's history will move on in a different way, and, um, like, if it worked, he's kind of got a point, really, like, if you yeah, could be 100% sure that, that, that it worked out. Um, I, part of the reason I wanted to get this one too is because um, it's something you don't see every day, which is Superman versus Wonder or Supergirl versus Wonder Woman. Uh, that's kind of fun. That's cool. And yeah. um, you know, you know, she comes in uh, sent by the Justice League to kind of kind of take. Uh, take a stand against Supergirl and try to make her realize what hell is doing. And so they get in a big giant battle and a lot of this is is uh, is action heavy, but it's good it's good action heavy and um there's there's emotional weight behind all the action and uh, it's 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 dynamite art. Uh, th this is by uh, uh Muhammad Asrar who I don't know, but it's really good, but it's really good. And um I don't care for how he draws Superman as the only thing. Superman looks a lot younger than he should in this and he squints all the time and I never like squinty Superman. That was a thing we got a lot in the early 2000s. <laughs> I don't like squinty Superman. Anyway, um, I highly recommend this. I thought this was a fantastically fun issue, and uh, it's enough to make me want to start buying this regularly again. Uh, hopefully after Hell on Earth, there's another really fun storyline that, that happens that makes me want to read about this character, because I like her. I, I want to see her learn and grow and, and, and to have and, and to learn how to have the same respect and interest in Earth that, that Superman has, because that's the big difference between them, is that she doesn't like Earth. She doesn't want to be there. She wants to go back home, but that's not going to happen. And uh, anyway... <laughs> quite good. I really enjoyed it. That's really interesting that they threw Wonder Woman there. She's she's a character of all the Justice League members because she's in a relationship with Superman now that should be involved in that crossover in some way. That's awesome. I'm really glad they did it. Yeah, and she's great in it. Good, Dan. Alright, the next book I have is Captain America number four. This one's by Rick Remender and John Romita Jr. And uh, we get some more of the really great uh, father-son stuff with uh, the guy that the kid that Cap rescued in Dimension Z from Aaron Zola. And um, this is really uh, another great character issue for Steve. We go back into the Depression era again and sort of examine how he uh, came to the sort of moral value, values that he holds so dearly to today. Um, really goes back to stuff that he, that he has with his mother, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, I don't really want to spoil too much. Because um, I think it's best experienced, you know, going in fresh. Um, there's this really big revelation at the end too. With with um, we kind of knew it the whole time, but it's sort of a, a, a Empire Strikes Back moment for the kid, and he sort of f figures out where his heritage comes from, all that sort of thing. And, and uh, it, it seems like it's going to be one of those stories where th there's this kid fighting against his destiny and thing. It, it's really interesting. Um, I, I find struggles like that to be uh, thing something that I like. So. Um, I'd highly recommend this. I think it's really good. The, the only th negative I have to say about it is John Romita Jr.'s art is a little bit shaky in here sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, the characters look a little inconsistent from panel to panel. Sometimes Steve, Kid Steve's head is extremely large in relation to his body. It looks sort of weird. Um, even more so than like things uh, like the book he does with Mark Millar with Hit Girl. <laughs> um, where people have really big heads, but it's even more so here. But anyway. Um, I really like this one. It's great character stuff from from Remender. He he's he's sort of the master at that. Uh, he's doing a lot of great soldier soldier sort of stuff like he did with Venom. Um, I really recommend this. If you if you like Cap at all, I, I think you might like this. 
Last thing for me is Spawn number 228, and uh, this is another one of those really, really fun parody covers that McFarlane has been doing. <laughs> um, this is one of the books that I can't, that, that I, I find myself talking more about the covers, Dan, than I do about the action <laughs> uh, so th this is uh, This is Action Comics number one, and it's, it's, it's the most violent parody of Action Comics number one I've ever <laughs> seen, where, like, he's got a, Spawn's got a car, and he's going up against the side of a mountain with blood all across the windshield. It's awesome. <laughs> um, anyway, I love this, Dan. It's just hilarious. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, as far as the uh, issue itself, um, I can't recommend it. And I would say that, uh, the, the, <laughs> if you want to buy this this uh, this issue, buy it for the cover. Um, so, uh, Captain Logan, why are you still buying Spawn? Because I collect it. Uh, the, the, th the thing about uh, Spawn <laughs> right now is that it's still really long and really dull, and I just can't get in into it. Um, it, it that, that might seem harsh, but that's just how I feel about it right now. Um, we do get a pretty ma major, um, not a revelation, but a pretty major, um, um, like, uh, a cliffhanger at the end of this. Uh, the, I won't give away who, but there is a major character who gets killed, and um, it does it does seem to, to relate to Clown. One, one thing I do really appreciate is that uh, Clown seems to be kind of going, kind of finally um, showing his true colors again, and we seem to be... I'm not sure if I'm getting a sense right now. Maybe I need to just go back and read everything together. Um, I, I, I'm not getting a real good sense as to why Clown was acting so out of character for so long, uh, befriending... Um, be befriending Jim Downing and um, talking like he just suddenly started reading a lot of classic literature. Uh, I don't. I don't understand. Uh, now he's starting to go a little bit back to his more sarcastic self. Um, we're, we're not all the way back to the fart jokes and stuff, but at least he's acting a little bit more like the clown I remember. And uh, he's it, it, at least I'm pretty sure he's evil. I, I, I at least can be pretty sure of that. Uh, Cogliostro is back. There's some 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 stuff going on with that. Um, but overall, like like. Jim Downing doesn't even appear in this issue. Uh, it's 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 all about um, his his best friend and um, what he's uh, b b b trying to uh, you know put together with with all this Jim Downing stuff. Um, it's it's all it's all more really mythology heavy. Really, all the characters trying to figure out the mythology, and there's not a lot of weight to it. I just um, I, I mean it's trying to be. To, to be really, um, you know, emotionally interesting, but I just, I don't care about any of these people right now, and um, I don't know, it's it's unfortunate, because I love where this was starting, and I'm, I'm glad that we're at least past the Jim Downing origin stuff, but, like, the issue right after all the Jim Downing origin stuff, Jim Downing's not even in the issue, so, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Right now, not real impressed with this one, unfortunately. Uh, that, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Good, Dan. Uh, all right. But the cover's uh, great! Next, the last book I have <laughs> is Morbius, The Living Vampire, number two. Ooh, I like that cover. That's fun. Yeah, it is really cool, isn't it? It's yeah. just, a, just a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is Mike Diodato, too. I got him to draw a cover for Morbius. I, oh, I was cool. kind of surprised by that. Uh, but anyway, the book is uh, pretty enjoyable. I like this one more than the first issue uh, because this gives us new information, basically. Uh, because the first issue I felt like r uh, retreaded a lot of ground from the point one issue that they did, which I happened to read. And uh, I know they had to sort of tell people that didn't read the point one, but I would argue, what's the point of doing the point ones if you're, if you're not gonna, if you're just gonna do the same thing the first issue anyway? I don't know. Um, the second issue w w does ha have a little bit of that problem. There's about four pages in here that are just scenes ripped straight from the first issue uh, in an attempt to recap and it's really, really weird yeah. uh, but the rest of the issue I really enjoyed actually <laughs> um, that sounds lazy yeah it, it's really weird uh, I don't know the the thing about it is it's trying to turn Morbius into this sort of pseudo hero thing and it's doing something similar to Daredevil Born Again where you have this guy on the street he's sort of homeless and he's down he's at the worst place in his life, basically. And the story, I assume, is going to be him coming all the way back up to that, rebuilding his life. And um, we get this really nice thing in here where he's trying to help out this kid that's um, being taken into a gang and sort of brainwashed into the life of gang violence in this really um, rough neighborhood that Morbius is, is homeless in right now. And um, there's some really touching stuff uh, about that and his mother. And... Um, it re it really tries to to take a look at uh, how dangerous gang violence and that sort of um, brainwashing techniques that they use on people how dangerous that can be to children in urban areas and that that, that was pretty interesting. Um, there there also some cool character stuff going on with Morbius. Um, 
showing that maybe he's a little bit more irredeemable than we thought at the beginning. Maybe he's he's really bound to have a life of evil, which or or not evil, but having to do terrible things in order to get the the right things done. Um, and that's sort of always been in his character. He's always been sort of the sympathetic villain that wants to do good and, and tries, but he always screws it up. Um, it's classic Morbius stuff. Uh, I don't know if I'd highly recommend this, but it, but it's solid. It, it's not bad. Um, Keatage and uh, Elson, I think, are doing a, a, a decent job with this, and I, I'm hoping that uh, it, it gets better as it goes along. But uh, that's all I have to say about that one. All right, well, that's all of our new acquisitions for the week. Really hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you like the new format, and feel free to leave us a comment and let us know what you think about it. Uh, Dan, thanks very much for being in my computer. Oh, no problem. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> okay. if you'd ever like to send us uh, anything to read on the Comic Vault, uh, feel free to send us things to our P.O. Box. That's Geek Pollution, P.O. Box 14183, Lenexa, Kansas, 66285. Dan and I will be back with you again for another video very shortly, and uh, we'll be back with more new acquisitions next Friday. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. We'll see you later.